Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library. So happy to be here with Doug Stewart, um, who's going to be talking about who really wrote Shakespeare. Um, I'm pretty sure by the end of this hour, or hour and 15 minutes, you we will have a maybe 95% um, surety on the reality of it. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. Well, that'll be a test of the, the hour, right? Um, so before we get started, I just want to let you know we do have captions and you can enable or disable them down at the bottom of Zoom. There's a button that says live transcript. If you click on the arrow next to it, you can hide them or show them. Um, that's really new for us and we love having being as accessible as possible. So um, the other thing I'd like to say is that we uh, like to thank the Cary Library Foundation for supporting all of our adult programs. We couldn't do this without them. So thank you. And we will be doing a Q&A after Doug's presentation. You can um, put your questions in the chat and I will feed them to Doug after, like I said, after his presentation. And, um, and if you have any tech issues or comments, chat as well. And I'll be monitoring that throughout. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Doug Stewart, who is a native Lexingtonian class, LHS, LHS class of 67. So you might see, uh, see some of your classmates here tonight, Doug. Um, he is a retired freelance writer who lives in Ipswich. More than 60 of his feature stories have appeared in Smithsonian Magazine, including several on Shakespeare and Elizabethan England. He's the author of a 2010 nonfiction book, The Boy Who Would Be Shakespeare, A Tale of Forgery and Folly. He does have a talk about that topic too, so we might have to have him back. So welcome, Doug. Thank you so much for having this talk with us. Thank you, Mina. It's my pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming here, um, or coming in quotes. This is my first presentation that's a virtual presentation, so it's a little odd. I'm used to being able to see people and ask questions. So um, this whole topic, the authorship controversy or the authorship question has been something that's fascinated me for a long time. And um, it's, there have been questions about who really wrote the works of Shakespeare. Shakespeare or somebody else for more than a hundred years. And I would now be asking for a show of hands, how many people don't? that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. And I'll assume some of you will raise your hand and most of you won't, okay. And um, if you look at uh, Wikipedia, which I don't normally recommend, but if you were to look at Wikipedia and go to a list of Shakespeare authorship candidates, I believe is the title, you see there are now 87 listed in alphabetical order, lots. These are six prominent uh, candidates you can see right here. There's uh, William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon on the far right, looking uncomfortable as usual. And from left to right, uh, Earl of Derby, Queen Elizabeth herself has been proposed as the real bard, Philip Marlowe, Sir Francis Bacon, who is the 19th century favorite, and the current reigning favorite for being the alternative Shakespeare is Edward de Vere, second from right, the 17th Earl of Oxford. And um, it's a surprisingly uh, fierce debate. Um, hang on a second, I just wanna, um, okay. Um, a number of prominent people have had doubts about Shakespeare's authorship. And there's two general reasons. One is a lack of evidence for Shakespeare and the other is what we do know about Shakespeare's life, Shakespeare's life doesn't really comport with what we would expect of the man who's widely considered the greatest writer in the history of English literature. Among the doubters are Mark Twain, Sigmund Freud, Walt Whitman, Orson Welles, uh, a, a number of British Shakespearean actors like Sir John Gilgood, Sir Derek Jacoby, Kenneth Branagh, uh, Michael York, Jeremy Irons, also um, the American uh, historian, David McCulloch, and uh, four Supreme Court justices. They had a uh, mock trial a few years ago, putting the case for um, Shakespeare in Oxford and four found for the Earl. Um, Henry James once wrote, he was haunted by the conviction that the divine William 
This is the biggest and most successful fraud ever practiced on a patient world. So uh, one of the big problems with the so-called Shakespeare hypo uh, Stratford hypothesis, which um, if you believe in alternate candidates, then you think uh, the usual story you hear that a commoner, William Shakespeare of Stratford upon Avon was the true uh, bard. Um, they look down on that as the Stratford hypothesis, which they don't buy. And one of the problems with this uh, so-called hypothesis is a lack of written evidence for Shakespeare. There are no manuscripts left from Shakespeare's life. We have no first drafts of anything Shakespeare wrote, not even a couplet. In fact, there's no documentary evidence, no proof that Shakespeare could write a complete sentence. All we have are six signatures, and these are facsimiles of the six, all of them on legal documents. Um, so that's a, a kind of a, a problem. It certainly raises suspicions for a lot of people. The earliest examples of anything Shakespeare wrote are printed examples, since we don't have the handwritten versions. This is the first, the earliest example of Hamlet from the first edition printed in 1603. And um, so this came before any other Hamlet. And you look at the famous soliloquy at the lower left and it begins to be or not to be. Hi, there's the point. Well, that's not, that's not the way I learned it in school. I've never heard that. Yet this predates the other Shakespeare's, the other Hamlet's. And that's part of the problem is there's so much uncertainty. There are different versions of Shakespeare. Um, a lot of, half his plays were never printed while he was alive. Um, and there were different handwritten versions later and different printed versions later, according to whoever printed them. So that's a problem. The other thing is when you look at Shakespeare's life, what we know of it, and there are certain definite things we know about William Shakespeare. Um, there are oddities that you wouldn't expect if he was the person who wrote the three dozen plays and more than a hundred sonnets that uh, we know. So one is he had a grammar school education, that's it. This is the grammar school in Stratford. So he presumably had been a student here, but in his early teens, he would have been done. Yet the same man used a uh, working vocabulary, 17,000 words, 17,000 unique words in uh, all his works. John Milton, by comparison, who was highly educated, multiple degrees, attended Oxford, used 8,000 unique words. That's half Shakespeare's biography. That seems odd. Another part of the biography that's strange is that, uh, I shouldn't say strange, but it doesn't inspire confidence that he's the bard. And that is, um, Shakespeare was the writer who wrote about great romances, wrote about the marriage of true minds. Yet his own marriage happened when he was 18. And Anne Hathaway, his girlfriend, was 26 and already pregnant, which sounds more like a shotgun wedding than a marriage of true minds. It probably was a shotgun wedding. So that's um, possibly bothersome. I should say these pictures, I'm just pulling them out of the internet. This is about from Shakespeare's time. Um, looks like it could have been Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway. I'm using the pictures mainly to aid, to jog my memory, because since I'm not reading a script. Hang on a sec. So Shakespeare came to London in his early 20s without his wife, by the way. He left his wife and children in Stratford for most of his career and was a single man in London. And we don't know much about what he did. This is an imaginary aerial view from about 1650, a little after Shakespeare's time. And you can still see the two, two uh, octagonal buildings in the foreground on the south bank of the Thames. One says the bear garden, where there'd be bear baiting, for like bullfighting. And then the globe, just left of center, which was one of the theaters where Shakespeare um, presented plays and probably acted. And we don't know much about him until he appears as the author of works that we now consider immortal, like uh, Richard III and Romeo and Juliet. Henry VI. So that's odd. This young man 
starts writing plays and right away they're masterpieces. Something strange about that. This is a website I found where you click on the icon and it takes you to the particular Shakespearean play. It's a map of where the plays are set, not just Denmark, not just England, but also lots of plays in Italy and France, Turkey, North Africa, um, the Balkans and so on. Well, Shakespeare uh, is not known ever to have ever to have left England or even Southern England. But judging from the settings of the plays, it seems like the author must have been a very well-traveled man. This is a 19th century painting, I believe of Hamlet, the play within the play in Hamlet. Um, and the point is Shakespeare was writing plays almost, well, usually he was writing about court life. He's writing about kings and queens and nobles and their personal uh, problems, fears, jealousies, uh, ambitions, and so on. It seems to be whoever wrote these plays was someone who was intimately acquainted with uh, the stresses and problems and um, deeds of royalty. Yet Shakespeare himself was a commoner from very humble beginnings. His father was a glover. Um, his family was apparently illiterate, at least his wife probably couldn't write, and at least one of his daughters. He certainly was not, uh, would have not had entree to the court of Queen Elizabeth or later King James, despite what you see in the movies where the queen and Shakespeare will be chummy. That is impossible. He was never a gentleman. He was never knighted, he's never Sir William. But the playwrights seem to have known a lot about these things. This is a, another 19th century image. This is uh, from Romeo and Juliet with a, a street battle between the rival clans, the Montagues and the Capulets. So there's lots of violence in Shakespeare's plays. There was also apparently violence in Shakespeare's life. He was once, uh, a man took out a restraining order for fear of death against Shakespeare and some other men. He thought Shakespeare was gonna kill him. Um, he was litigious. He once sued a man for 35 shillings. And then uh, later, um, well, in Stratford, he was um, known. This is Mary Arden's farm, by the way. I would ask for a show of hands here. How many people have been to Stratford? If so, did you go to Mary Arden's farm? She's uh, Shakespeare's mother, Mary Arden Shakespeare. And in Stratford, Shakespeare was known not as a writer, not as an actor, not as a playwright, or any kind of celebrity. He was a grain merchant. Um, and in fact, in 1598, there was a famine in Stratford where people died of starvation. And a neighbor uh, published a notice saying that Shakespeare and some of the other landowners should be strung up on gibbets at their doors for hoarding grain during the famine. And that's not proof for or against, but it does, it's bothersome. Um, when you think about Shakespeare, you think about these plays where the playwright must have been a, a wise judge of human character, human nature, and um, somebody that would probably give good advice and knew a lot about how the world works. And um, it just doesn't jibe. And then there's the will. This is the third page of a three page will with Shakespeare's signature at the, near the bottom. By me, William Shakespeare. His handwriting is terrible. He didn't write the will. That would be a scribe. He only signed his name. His handwriting is so bad, people disagreed about how it was spelled. He was spelled many different ways in his lifetime in print, like Shaq's Bird, Shag's Beer, and stuff like that. And in the will, he leaves his wife, Anne Hathaway, his second best bed, which sounds a little churlish. Um, lots of scholars have written lots of word, words about how an Elizabethan England or uh, Jacobian England, a second best bed was really quite a good bed to try to defend Shakespeare, I guess, where I think they're protesting too much maybe, because uh, it's hard to explain that away. This is a 
funeral cortege in the 1580s for Sir Philip Sidney, who died young, another playwright, Shakespeare's contemporary. Normally, when high ranking people and celebrated people died, London would go into mourning. There was a whole ritual for that with black bunting and a funeral cortege, followed by burial in Westminster Abbey. Um, Shakespeare was never, uh, London did not go into mourning when he died in 1616. No one's found any uh, evidence that there was even any notice of his passing in London. He wasn't buried in Westminster Abbey, yet um, John Beaumont, I think, let me just check my notes. There's another playwright that he um, collaborated with at the end of his career. Um, yeah, Francis Beaumont died the month before Shakespeare. Probably none of us have heard of Francis Beaumont. London went in the morning for him, funeral cortege, fanfare, burial next to Chaucer in Westminster Abbey, but not Shakespeare. Shakespeare was buried in an, an unmarked grave here at, at uh, Trinity Church in Stratford. Later on, they added identifying marks as friends came and thought, well, this isn't good enough. And no one also knows really what he looks like, really. As this is the best known picture in the United States anyway. This is an engraving done for the title page of the first folio printed after Shakespeare's death in 1623. And he looks pretty distant, actually watchful, maybe a little, um, Paranoid. The, author, the artist was Martin Dreisart, who's a none too talented Danish engraver. Uh, I think that it's taken to be an authenticatable image of Shakespeare because friends of his paid to have it done. They pulled together the first folio, and these are people that remembered him seven years after his death. If they paid for it, it must look slightly like him. And he's the only other portrait with any claimed authenticity. This is a portrait bust in the uh, church near the grave in Stratford. And also, I think we can agree, I can't hear or see you, but I think we can agree this is not a great work of art. There was a uh, biographer of Shakespeare, J. Dover Wilson, 1932. Uh, in his biography, he said this is clearly a false image of the great bard. And um, he said in this bust, he looks like a self-satisfied pork butcher. And so in uh, Wilson's own biography of Shakespeare, he used this portrait on the frontispiece, known as the Grafton portrait. There is no evidence this is Shakespeare. I think the evidence mainly came from the man who owned it, who said he'd heard it was Shakespeare. Wilson used it saying, I know there's no proof or even evidence, but I like his oval Shelley-like face better. So I'm using it. And that's one of the uh, things that happens with Shakespeare is people sort of create the Shakespeare they want. This is a, 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 an engraving showing a bas relief that used to be on the facade of England's first art museum, the Shakespeare Gallery, built in 1789 in London. You can see the artist, since he had a lot to work with, nobody really knew what Shakespeare looked like. Nobody ever said whether he was tall or short, chubby or thin, uh, nothing. Also, no one ever said they met Shakespeare. No one, um, there's no record of anybody bumping into him. Or, um, so the artist gave Shakespeare the musculature of a Greek god in the same languorous pose because why not? And uh, this is William Henry Ireland. And Mina mentioned, I wrote a book 10 years ago. I just want to mention it briefly because William Henry Ireland was an actual, a young legal apprentice uh, and a failure in school who claimed in the 1790s in Lon London to have discovered a trunk filled with Shakespeare's personal papers. And it was actually all stuff he wrote himself, including two full length plays, faking Shakespeare's handwriting which nobody could disprove because they'd never seen his real handwriting. And instead of being skeptical, some people were, but a lot of people, including the poet laureate, 
and various nobles and uh, the future um, King William IV were sure they were real because people thought, well, Shakespeare's papers couldn't really have been thrown away, so they must have been put away for safekeeping, and here they are. And one thing William Henry did is he took uh, an early edition of the first edition of King Lear and reverse engineered it. There were no first drafts, he made a first draft. He used old paper, old ink. This is not the original forgery, this is an engraving made from it. The original would have had burn marks and water stains and other um, falsification. But he took the printed version and wrote his own first draft from it and made changes. So in King Lear, Kent insults Oswald with vile language and the fool has obscene prattling. William Henry changed all that or took it out. And when people saw this, a lot of people said in England in the 1790s, well, finally, we're seeing the real Shakespeare without those changes, without the sullying done by those evil printers and improvising actors that have um, contaminated Shakespeare's good name. Here's a love letter forged, an engraving of the love letter, which originally had a lock of hair from Shakespeare to Anne Hathaway. And people responded by thinking, well, finally, now we know Shakespeare did love his wife, despite the second best bed. And one of the plays called Vortigern and, Vortigern and Rowena was performed at the Theater Royal at Drury Lane to a packed audience in 1796. Thousands turned away. Many of the people there thought they were seeing the first premiere of a Shakespeare play in 160, 70 years. Another large contingent believed it was fake from the start. So it was a pretty unruly night. Play closed after one night. Historians later said it was laughed off the stage, which is absolutely not true. Even the critics weren't sure what they had seen. Um, because people, you know, it's hard to judge a forgery and it's hard to judge Shakespeare. People always think they know him better than they do. Um, so he remains a mystery. You know, it's hard to say this authorship controversy uh, keeps cooking. Um, and it's been going on since the 19th century and those shows no sign of abating. This is Mary Bacon who really kicked off the controversy in 1850. She's an American who had grave doubts about Shakespeare for some of the reasons I've described. Her favorite candidate was this man, Sir Francis Bacon. No relation, Mary Bacon, Francis Bacon, but still, as it happens, uh, he was her pick. He was a statesman, a diplomat, a philosopher, a scientist, a contemporary of Shakespeare, very well dressed, as you can see. And Mary Bacon and others believed they found coded clues in Shakespeare's work, pointing to Shakespeare, uh, uh, excuse me, pointing to Bacon. Um, if I had a week, I could start telling you about some of these codes. So I'll just show you one picture of one code where someone took the first folio and superimposed a circle with some diameters. And there's a reason for where it's placed. And if you follow the lines, you see, I am Bacon. There doesn't, there's probably a couple dozen books about this dating from um, the mid 19th century. Another candidate, Philip Marlowe, was a very distinguished playwright, although he died young, very young. Um, and to people who believed in Marlowe, uh, Marlowe uh, was a talented writer, but his plays written after his death, uh, that is the plays that appeared after his, his death must have been parceled out by friends, you know, one play every year or something. And they were held in abeyance and that would explain how someone who died so much younger than Shakespeare could have been the real poet. This is Sir Walter Raleigh. You notice a, a, a theme here. These are very well, very well dressed candidates. Sir Walter Raleigh was definitely a central member of Queen Elizabeth's court, an adventurer, an explorer, and uh, a poet. Queen Elizabeth herself, as I said earlier, is one of the candidates. She published poetry in her lifetime as queen. 
and this is now the reigning favorite for the last hundred years. Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, probably better dressed than any of them. And uh, he was a playwright, although none of his plays survived. He was one of the most um, prestigious aristocrats in England as the 17th Earl of Oxford, educated at Oxford. He was a ladies man, champion jouster, multilingual, well-traveled, lived in, in, in Italy for a while. Um, Queen herself was said to have complimented him on his dancing ability. And um, let's see what else, a clothes horse, obviously. <laughs> and as I said, he was known to have written plays, but none of them survived. Hey, Doug. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that you're talking about Christopher Marlowe, not Philip Marlowe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did someone say something in the chat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, Philip Marlowe. We can make him the 98th um, candidate. <laughs> yeah, Christopher Marlowe. Um, uh, definitely. I didn't mean um, Raymond Chandler's private eye. <laughs> Thanks, Good Reggie. Point. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Reggie. There'll be more of these, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, so this is um, an actor, Riss Evans, Welsh actor, who played Earl of Oxford in a movie called Anonymous that came out 10 years ago. If we were live, I'd say, show of hands, how many people saw Anonymous? Um, probably not too many. It wasn't a bad movie. But this is Oxford secretly writing the works of Shakespeare in a you know, his private chamber with the door closed, and then he would slip the manuscripts under a door without being caught. You might say, well, why was he hiding his authorship? The um, argument is that as a top noble in England, writing for the English public stage, which was a disreputable, kind of a, a, um, very down market, uh, affair in those days where women weren't allowed on stage and so on, it would have hurt his reputation as an aristocrat and his standing at the royal court if it got out that he was writing plays for this hurly burly world. It'd be like writing scripts for television, I guess. And so instead of taking credit, he found a stooge, William Shakespeare, um, who was a illiterate comic actor in the movie, and he takes the credit even though he can't read the plays. Not well-dressed, as you can see. So here's a painting of Queen Elizabeth's court. Um, I don't know if the Earl of Oxford is there, but he might well be. I'm not sure if these are supposed to be real people or just imaginary courtiers, but he was definitely well-placed, Oxford was. He, he, his parents died when he was young. The 16th Earl died. He became a 17th Earl as a child, inherited estates, lots of money. He was taken in by um, Robert Cecil, Lord Burley, this man, who was one of, uh, he was the head of the Queen's Privy Council. And in the days before a real functioning parliament, the Privy Council was the nearest thing to a counterweight to the Queen's power, although it wasn't very powerful, but he was the head of it. So. Um, he was uh, essentially Oxford's adoptive father. Oxford ended up marrying his daughter, Anne. So, and also uh, Burley was said to be this kind of long-winded person who was a little tiresome. And Oxfordians, as they're known, have drawn parallels between Burley and Polonius and Hamlet and his daughter, Anne and Ophelia. Polonius's daughter. And there are lots of other parallels that can be drawn. So these are two other earls. It's the third Earl of Southampton on the left, the fourth Earl of Pembroke on the right. And both of these men were important in some way to Shakespeare's life or to the writer's life in that Shakespeare wrote two long uh, narrative poems, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece that he was better known for and may have made more money from than as a playwright. And the narrative poems are dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. The first folio, seven years after Shakespeare's death, the first collected work 
first edition of his collected works was dedicated to Earl Pembroke. So both these high ranking men must have had a pretty intimate connection to William Shakespeare or to the author. Well, one of Oxford's daughters when she was grown was offered in marriage to the Earl of Southampton. And another daughter did marry um, the son of the Earl of Pembroke. So maybe it's a coincidence, but it's kind of telling. One thing that keeps this authorship question boiling is um, the Shakespeare Authorship Coalition, which are Oxfordians. And there are lots of them. They have conventions. They have new books every year, practically. Lots of blogs and blogging. And in this case, uh, th their enemy, the Shakespeare Authorship Coalition, is the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. They're the people that control Stratford today. Um, and so here it says that the group is dedicated to legitimizing the Shakespeare authorship issue by increasing awareness of reasonable doubt about the identity of William Shakespeare. SAC challenges Shakespeare Birthplace Trust to mock trial, offers 40,000 pounds donation if they prove Shakespeare wrote works. So they call him Shakespeare just because that was one of the many spellings, why not? Why would they decline if the case for him is quote, beyond doubt? Which is a pretty good question, I think. So let's see, here's Stratford today. I was there when I was a child long, long ago. It didn't look like this, but it is at this point a theme park. And the, doubt, the doubters say that the Shakespeare industry is so lucrative, cash flow is so strong and steady, at least before the pandemic, that they don't want to upset the apple cart by um, expressing doubts or um, allowing doubts in, their, in Stratford about uh, Shakespeare's authorship. To them, it's Will Shakespeare of Stratford. There's a refrigerator magnet you can buy today in Stratford. Shakespeare ginger cookies, of course. Shakespeare teapot. You lift his head off, pour the water in. Pour the tea out the spout in the form of a rolled up manuscript of Hamlet. It says, alas, poor York. I knew him well, Horatio, which is a misquote. It's actually, Alas, poor York, I knew him, Horatio. I don't want to be snarky, but I believe in proofreading. So anyway, I had done a lot of reading about this in order to uh, convince my editor to write about it for Smithsonian. Um, and I was reading things for my own benefit. And the more I read, the more I became convinced that Oxford was Shakespeare. I became an Oxfordian. And what, the tip, what tipped the balance for me um, was this Bible, the Geneva Bible that it once belonged to the Earl, the 17th Earl. And this is in the collection of the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington. This is a Geneva Bible, but not Oxford's. Oxford's Bible was filled with marginalia, marginalia and underlinings, lots and lots of them, presumably made by the Earl. I see the right margin is pretty full here, but a lot of the margins had room for marginalia. And there was a graduate student working on his PhD at UMass Amherst named Roger Strittnatter, who about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, was working on a thesis where he was comparing the highlighted points or the uh, noted parts of this Bible with Shakespeare's work using a concordance where every word is included and you can look things up easily. And when he compared underlined passages and notable themes highlighted in the Bible with Shakespeare's work, he said the correlation was much greater than could possibly be explained by chance. And one example, and this is the one that got me, that Strit Matter pointed out is there's a, underlining in Oxford's Bible about Goliath, David and Goliath. And it says his spear was like a weaver's beam, which is a pretty super specific metaphor. 
Well, the same super specific metaphor appears in the Merry Wives of Windsor. So I thought, aha, it's got to be true. Whoever owned this Bible and underlined that must be the author of the Merry Lives of Windsor. At that point, I got the assignment and started really doing research where I started telephoning for the first time actual English professors and historians of the English Renaissance. Until now, I've been mostly talking to essayists and doubters. And I have to say right away, um, I got sobering results. One person said, okay, Weaver's Beam. Well, look at Thomas Nash's play, 1592. He talked about a Weaver's Beam. Gabriel Harvey, 1593, he talked about something as big as a Weaver's Beam. It was in the air. Everybody was talking about Weaver's Beans in the 1590. Shakespeare might have recited the line as an actor on stage before he wrote Merry Wives. And, um, this is sort of the story of my research. <laughs> I was an Oxfordian and then I started really doing my homework. So it's true there's not a lot of great evidence that Shakespeare was the bard, but it has to be said for Oxford, there is zero, there is no evidence. There are little um, correlations you can draw, it's true. Um, like with Lord Burley, maybe being like Polonius, but nobody ever placed him there. It doesn't make sense that he would be hiding his authorship. Um, and Shakespeare, it's true, he might not have been a nice guy. He might have threatened violence, but he never murdered, murdered anybody. Oxford murdered somebody. He uh, ran his sword through an undercook in Burley's household, and was put on trial for murder. He claimed it was an accident. But he may also have just looked down on this undercook. He wasn't even a real cook. He's an earl and he just stabbed him, pretending to be dueling. Um, he was also, uh, he abandoned Anne for five years, living in um, Italy. He was profligate. He spent money like crazy. He had a huge fortune as a, as a child, actually, and he went through it and was hounded by creditors for the rest of his life. The queen had to put him on a, a yearly retainer to keep from embarrassing the English aristocracy. Um, he had been part of her court until he got one of her ladies in waiting pregnant and she expelled him. So he wasn't physically at the court anymore. So as for some of the other um, reasons for doubt that I mentioned, a, a chief one being the lack of a paper trail this is a, a play script from Elizabethan times, about 1600, very rare. And the reason is, this was from a play Sir Thomas More that was never produced, never staged, and never printed. Once a play was staged, once the run was over, or once it was printed, normally you didn't need the paper anymore. And paper was expensive, it was handmade, usually in France. When you were through with it, you weren't going to put it in a filing cabinet for the next 50 years. That was an extravagance nobody would do. So it would be reused for lining a pie tin or stiffening a book binding, um, but it wouldn't have been saved. And also the idea of saving uh, an object from a great person's life, that started with the Romantic period, the late 1700s. In Shakespeare's day, nobody did that. You didn't put things aside. Um, it really started in the late 1700s, uh, especially with uh, Napoleon, Lord Nelson, Shelley's guitar, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see what else. I should mention, some people think this is Shakespeare's handwriting. Uh, somebody had done editing on Sir Thomas More. Shakespeare might have, he knew the people that wrote it, he was available to do it. And I've noticed people are starting to talk about this like it's Shakespeare's hand. Well, there actually is no evidence. It's just conjecture. So I thought I'd throw that out there. It's like the portrait. There are portraits of questionable authenticity and years pass and people start saying, well, this is Shakespeare. No, not necessarily. Here's a painting from the 19th century with Shakespeare in the center in black velvet. And I'm including this just to remind myself to say that the world of the public stage as today is a collaborative one. People don't work in isolation. 
a playwright would be bouncing ideas off other people with other playwrights, with the actors, the actors would improvise, then the, the, the playwrights, Shakespeare would have been watching carefully how the audiences responded. And it was all about the performance. Most people in England were illiterate in Shakespeare's day. So if you knew Shakespeare's because you saw his plays. And Shakespeare worked with collaborators probably for years when he was in his 20s. He was the unsung uh, helper to older, more established playwrights. And um, so when he finally got credit for his own work, yes, they were polished works, but that's because he'd been writing for quite a while. And at the end of his life too, he had lots of collaborators. And the plays he wrote, um, they go in and out of the canon as uh, scholars change their minds about what he wrote with whom, how much of each play he actually wrote. Henry VIII has gone in and out. The play called Double Falsehood entered the canon uh, in 2007 with an edition from the Arden Shakespeare Library in England because they studied it and decided, no, I think Shakespeare must have written this section. It's a very um, unsure process. It's not like you would think. This is a first edition of Romeo and Juliet, 1597. You'll notice no byline. This was not unusual. Half of Shakespeare's plays were never printed. Of those that were printed, half didn't include his name. Theaters wouldn't have included his name necessarily. And you might think it's strange, but think about television. If you love Game of Thrones, can you name the screenwriter? I mean, most people probably can't. But there were 42 plays published in uh, England in the 1590s. Of those seven had an author listed, 35 or anonymous, which begs the question, well, if Oxford wrote all these things, if he didn't want the humiliation of writing for the um, scruffy London theater, why didn't he just publish anonymously like so many other people? These are some of the many words that Shakespeare's credited with using first. And this is one of the arguments for how a person with a grammar school education couldn't be Shakespeare. But you look at some of these words like lackluster, you know, lacking luster or uh, worthless, um, cold-blooded, besmirch. You know, you don't need to go to college to think of those. You need to be someone who loves a wordplay, someone who's creative, someone who loves to write and play with words and think about words. You know, he was a creative person. And uh, I'm not sure you'd learn that at Oxford. Here's a picture of Stratford. So Stratford, okay, he wasn't known as a playwright. Strange. Even in the 1700s, people, a lot of people in town didn't recognize the name, didn't know who he was when tourists started showing up looking for memorabilia. Well, Stratford in the early 1600s was a Puritan town. These are Puritans showing their... Uh, approach to literary art by using books as footrests. And they did not allow actors and plays in Stratford-upon-Avon. There were no theaters. And there's even a record from the borough Chamberlain of giving six pounds to the King's men six years after Shakespeare died, not to perform at the hall in Stratford. Um, the King's men was uh, Shakespeare's acting troupe later on. Troops would go from town to town as itinerants and perform a play for a while and then move on for money. So that the Puritans would pay money to not have actors perform tells you something about Stratford. Shakespeare may have wanted not, it, not to have it brooded about that he was an actor, let alone a playwright. So here are just six random aristocrats from England around 1600, actually late 1500s, all very well dressed. And it's true, Shakespeare, uh, I think we can make an educated guess that he did not hobnob with any of these people, but he didn't need to. Well, he needed to write about these kinds of people because if you did not set your plays 
in the world of the aristocracy. If you didn't write about kings and queens in particular, you weren't going to make a living as a playwright because that's what the public demanded. They also wanted plays about ancient Greek, Greece and Rome, which Shakespeare delivered. Well, he never went to ancient Greece or ancient Rome, and neither did any other playwrights, but they used their imagination. And that's really the important thing is Shakespeare was imaginative and a lot of this going, combing through the works, looking for biographical clues. Shakespeare of all playwrights, of all writers, kept himself well concealed. You don't learn what he was like by seeing his plays or reading them. He was um, creative. That's why he's still as famous now as he was 400 years ago. His plays are supremely adaptable, like Romeo and Juliet in contemporary LA with gas stations and street gangs were my personal favorite of Shakespeare movies. Richard III with Ian McKellen as an English Nazi in the 1930s. And it fits perfectly, it's not a stretch. Shakespeare wasn't writing about his time. He wasn't writing to satirize the English society he knew. Moliere did that in the 1600s in the court of Louis XIV. He was writing about bourgeois hypocrisy in France, the people he knew. And I love Moliere. My wife and I usher a lot in Boston and Cambridge until the pandemic, maybe three or four times a month. And I've been seeing lots of Moliere, lots of Shakespeare and other things. I love Moliere, but it's a different kind of thing. With Shakespeare, it's more uh, universal. This is Ben Johnson, who is a, a friend and rival of Shakespeare, also a very uh, illustrious playwright of the Elizabethan age. And he wrote in the first folio that um, uh, Shakespeare, who he knew well, he said, he was not of an age, but for all time. And that's really the point. He was saying in 2021, you'll still be enjoying his plays. And that is absolutely true. And when the Oxfordians try to argue for Oxford or anybody else, it's hard to explain away what Johnson wrote in his eulogy in the first folio in 1623, where he called him the sweet swan of Avon. And uh, Oxford did not live on the Avon River. And he said, to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. And it's also hard to argue that uh, Ben Johnson and everybody else involved in pulling together this huge volume, the first folio, it's hard to figure why they would continue the ruse of disguising the Earl of Oxford's true authorship seven years after Shakespeare died and um, 19 years after the Earl of Oxford died, he died in 1604. Why continue this? Uh, who are they protecting it really? doesn't make sense. One of the professors I interviewed in England, um, a scholar in Warwickshire near Stratford said, Shakespeare has become a God. He's a secular God today. As in this painting by a young South Korean artist who put himself on the lower left, J.W. Jong, showing an enthroned Shakespeare, who looked kind of like Heath Ledger, I think. And then a bunch of people, both believers and doubters. And uh, Jonathan Bate, this Warwickshire scholar said, if Shakespeare hadn't become a god, uh, he wouldn't be worth having authorship controversy about. You know, we know nothing about Chaucer or Spencer, never seen their manuscripts, but who cares? Shakespeare we care about. So, I think uh, I finished without going over an hour and I hope there's questions and I hope I can answer them. I should just remind you, I'm a freelance magazine writer. It's a subject I've written about and I've read lots about and I go to a lot of plays, but I'm not a historian and I am definitely not a uh, professor of English literature. So if you have questions. Thank you, Doug. Um, do you want to stop your screen share and then we can go into yeah. Q and A? Okay, let me. Uh, my cursor's disappeared. Hang on a sec. I need <laughs> to there, it's close. I think I can ah. do it. 
No, okay, I got, you got it. it. Okay, it, great. It yeah, no, your 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 screen share is over. Okay. Um, sure. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. So people can start putting their questions in the chat, or um, if you unmute yourself, I'll be paying attention and you can ask your question directly. Um, yeah. But Red, Reggie said, he wonders what you think about the Chandos's portrait. It oh, is supposedly yeah. to have been painted in the early 1600s before Shakespeare died. Right. Um, it's in a place of honor at the National Portrait Gallery in Trafalgar Square. The Chandos portrait is a portrait of, uh, I have a copy nearby, but I won't go look for it. Um, it's not proven to be Shakespeare, but the, the, um, I once wrote a story about Shakespeare's portraiture and the curator of this show called Searching for Shakespeare said that the Chandos portrait is their Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa of the National Portrait Gallery. So they're putting all their eggs in that basket, but she <laughs> said, we can't really prove it, but it's, um, uh, I wonder if, could somebody actually call it up? Should I screen share? Or Mina, could you screen share and just type in Jando's portrait? Sure. Just give yeah. me a sec. Um, one reason it was rejected is he's got kind of dark skin and a big nose. And uh, there was a man, um, Stevens, a Shakespeare editor and scholar of the 18th century, who said it couldn't be. Um, Shakespeare, because he, he looks like a Jew and has the complexion of someone with jaundice. And he's wearing an earring. You know, all these things, it's not, they not, it's not what they wanted to think. And with portraiture, so often what people want is someone that, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I have to say, it doesn't look much like the Drace out engraving or like the portrait bust, but I'd, I don't know. But I would say it's very good chance that is Shakespeare. It's too bad it wasn't better um, authenticated. And by the way, that picture to the left in the second row is a forgery done in the 18th century. But the Chandos <laughs> portrait was done. Uh, yeah, that's a forgery in the top right. Chandos portrait was done during Shakespeare's lifetime. And it's just about what you would expect. It's not a great portrait, but why would it be? Why would a middle-class man like Shakespeare have had his portrait done. Some patron must have paid for it. Interesting. Uh, yeah, lots of forgeries. And the same curator said she gets Shakespeare forgery showing up several times a year. Oh. You know, it's like Leonardo paintings, they just keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing to me that after so many hundreds of years, people are still so interested in these topics. Um, Shakespeare so, forgery. Forgery of, I mean, like that, that they would still try to, you know, make forgeries of, of Shakespeare or well, I think the problem is, I mean, here's what it really comes down to. Um, people think they know Shakespeare really well. We invoke his name to stand for literary genius. You know, Shakespeare is great literature, Mozart, musical genius, Leonardo, artistic genius. And it's sort of shorthand. It's a little lazy. How well do people know Shakespeare? How many people have read The Rape of Lucrece? I tried to read it. It's terrible. It's purple prose. It goes on and on as though he's paid by the word. It's about a rape. It's very sensationalistic. I finally bought a book on tape version on cassette with Sir Richard Burton reading it. <laughs> Even then, I could barely stay awake. So we talk about Shakespeare like he was unerring. Like he was, you know, faultless, and it's not true. I mean, King John, have you ever read King John? It's interesting, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, we can get a little lazy and it just it becomes shorthand for something else. Yeah. Right. Um, so Reggie also says that B. Johnson was also one of the most jealous of the Elizabethan writers. Who was? B. Johnson? B. Reggie, no. is that correct? Am I saying that right? Oh, Ben Johnson. Ben. Ben, ben Johnson was the most jealous. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, he was a friend of Shakespeare. Um, he was also, I think, a middle class guy. Most writers, and that may still be true, were people of independent means. You know, to be a writer, be an artist, it helps to have money. 
Shakespeare was unusual in that he was an ink-stained wretch. He was a middle-class writer who became wealthy, somewhat wealthy, with his pen. Ben Johnson was the same. So I would imagine he was pretty sharp-elbowed. <laughs> um, and also, he actually put together his own first folio. He collected his own works, published them, called them the works of Ben Johnson. He was belittled for that, to have the nerve to call plays, which were ephemera for the public works of literature. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe, but that's the way things were back in that day. This, this also bears on why people didn't save things. When the Bodleian Library was founded at Oxford, I think in the early 1600s, they wouldn't take play scripts. They considered them trash. It was like a soap opera script. Why would you have that in, an, in a university archive? Um, Maybe that's why we nowadays don't throw away anything. I'm only speaking for myself, people, but. <laughs> yeah, times have changed. Historiography has changed. Mm -hmm. you know, museum exhibits that used to be about the royalty and about the highborn people. And now it's, were there slaves in this house museum? You know, how about the Irish immigrants who lived here? And, um, very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I was, yeah. I, I actually have a question about why do you think these rumors persist? Why do they keep happening? Uh, the authorship controversy? Yeah. Well, I think the Americans uh, are driving it. Mm -hmm. Is this public? Am I being recorded? If, you I are being America, recorded. if I said America was a paranoid country, would I pay for it? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of paranoia. I mean, look at all the online conspiracy theories. This mm -hmm. fits right in. Because this would have had to be a huge conspiracy. You know, you can't write plays in isolation, as I said, there would have had to be a lot of people who were involved and in covering up. Plays would be going back and forth, there'd be changes, they'd say, Shakespeare, we need another change. Imagine what it's like on a you know, TV studio where they're you know, working on stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's fun, that's the other thing, it is fun. It's like uh, <laughs> witchcraft, believing in witches, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna ask Reggie. Yeah. I'm gonna ask Reggie to unmute himself because he has a question. Yeah. Thank you, Mina, and, and thank you, Doug, for for what you're doing. Um, speaking to the last point yeah. you just made, uh, Peter Saccio was speaking, um, who I think you might say is an ardent Stratfordian, and but he was um, he was saying that one of the reasons he's convinced that Shakespeare was who we think he is is because of the nature of what was happening at the theater in Elizabethan England, which was at its height, probably somewhere around 150 to 200 people. We said probably was working in this and that everybody knew what everybody else was doing. Just yeah. like what you, what you just mentioned, right? That yeah. that nothing is written in isolation. If you had this, per and it wasn't like it was a ton of places to play. So people no. had a tendency to play in the same places. And so everyone knew, and of course the sharing back and forth of work and of writing wasn't something like this. It's not the no-no that it is today. Yeah, and stealing. Yeah, and, 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 King Lear and, and Hamlet that had already been done. Just right, to, right. You work them. Exactly, and, and, and so Peter Sancho says, given the fact, of course, is there's only like maybe two plays that have original uh, plots. I, I think it's uh, Love, Labor's Lost, and The Tempest. And, the, you know, the rest of the stuff tends to be coming out of someplace else. Um, he says, given all of that, it would seem that people accepted this guy as the writer of the work. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really hard to conceive how it could be otherwise. And I hope I made clear in my presentation, I am no longer an Oxfordian, once I started doing my homework, <laughs> to be very clear, it didn't hold water at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Anybody else, feel free to unmute. You don't have to use the chat. So Hannah, you have a question? Go ahead and hit unmute. Hannah, oh. you can hit unmute. Or anybody else? For everyone who's, who's having a, a problem, if you just press the space bar and hold it down, you should be able okay. to just to just speak if your if your stuff is working normally. Oh, there she goes. Oh, thank you so much. It was really a wonderful presentation, especially the 
Good. Rich images that you had. Uh, I just have two quick comments and then a question. Yeah. And so it's my understanding that the second best bed was really very good because people in those times always kept the best bed for the guests. And then my second comment is, as a, a former teacher in Lexington, I used to teach Shakespeare. And I tell you, some students are very bright. They're amazing. They go on and on with their creativity. So I'm glad you mentioned that because Shakespeare apparently was very creative. And also the schools in Stratford would, would have been much more difficult even than the school in Lexington. I didn't they, mention that. I should have said. They learned Greek and Latin. They read Ovid in the original. Yeah. Right. And they went all year round, practically. No long summer vacation. His father took him to plays. So in a way, it's almost like now where the family has a big influence on him. So yeah. he joined the plays as a young child and would have absorbed that and loved it. Absolutely. That. Well, thank you, Hannah, for those two comments. I should have mentioned some of them myself. And what's <laughs> your question? Can you, you question? share? Could you share with us any uh, highlights of working with the Folger Museum in Washington? Ooh. Well, boy, I mean, the whole place is really fun. Um, oh. They have a basement that's like off limits, and I went in. And they just I think they have uh, a majority of the world's first folios. There might be 600 and they've got like 300 first folios. <laughs> and one was stolen recently at the University of Durham and it was insured for $4 million. Oh, wow. It's just amazing. But it's a great place. Um, I was only there to visit. I never did work there. And they have the flowers portrait in the main room over the fireplace, which is a forgery. They uh, had it analyzed in the 1980s and found out that it's got a bald head, like we know Shakespeare was bald, and they took the paint off and there's a full head of hair underneath. And this was after the great Shakespeare Jubilee in 1769 in Stratford, which really started Shakespeare's rebirth. Mm -hmm. since it had been forgotten really after his death. And that's when the forgeries just really came out of the woodwork. Yeah. So it, I recommend the Folger Shakespeare Library. It's open to the public, but you probably they probably won't let you into the basement where the, the archives are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do we have any additional questions? No, not Maybe seeing I any. I can ask a question. Sure. Yeah, this Praveen, I, only in my old age now, learning to learn Shakespeare. And just to give you a little anecdote, uh, there was this professor uh, who came from India to Cambridge and then to Harvard and then to University of Chicago. And he died, I guess, a few years ago in his 70s or 80s. And I was reading his biography and he said, you know, one thing he wants to do before he dies, he wants to read Shakespeare. And it wasn't clear to me whether he did or not, uh, but I took a class in King Lear, and maybe I was going to ask you, Doug, uh, do you have any suggestions about uh, what Shakespeare plays to read, uh, if I cannot read all of them? Well, I have to say, um, the best way to experience Shakespeare, if you can, is to see live performances. And it doesn't have to be a great company. Uh, I have... I've read Shakespeare plays, and I certainly read them in school, which wasn't always fun. But it's amazing what theater troops are doing now. I saw an all-female Julius Caesar in, at the Huntington in a workshop five years ago. It was fabulous, um, where it was a, just in a small room, <laughs> two rows of chairs on all four sides of this little stage. Um, there was a punk acting group at the Huntington Theater a few years ago that did uh, Richard III. It featured not one, but two chainsaw decapitations. Oh. They had plastic sheeting all over the wooden stage so the fake stage blood would soak into the wood. Not to everybody's taste, but I like plays with a big body count myself. <laughs> and I saw Othello 
in Boston in the South End a few years ago. It was a theater in the round at the Boston Center for the Arts. And the man who played Iago was incredible. At one point, he popped into a seat right next to me. You know, it was a theater in a round with really steep mm -hmm. seats. Uh -huh. And he was heckling the actors on stage, but doing it in <laughs> character. He was a nasty Iago. Oh, that changed my view of Othello. And I think something like that is always going to be more powerful than reading Shakespeare. And the other thing is just like with the movies, the words are just part of it. It's also the acting, it's the sets, it's the pacing, it's what the actors choose to skip and what they choose to emphasize because they're not really giving you everything. And a lot of times they're edited versions. So uh, I think live theater, it's expensive, but um, if you usher, <laughs> you can see everything. Oh, you do that, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, can, I have to agree that with that, Doug. And <laughs> Carol actually says, on a much lighter note, have yeah. you watched Upstart Crow on PBS? It's a British sitcom written as part of the 400th anniversary of the death of Shakespeare. Her husband, she and her husband think it is cleverly written by Ben Elton using Shakespeare's line, lines as its plot. I have not seen it and I've read about it because Upstart Crow is a famous line by an older playwright. It's the first mention of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. and there's an Upstart Crow dressed in- It was Robert Greene. Yeah, Robert Greene, exactly. And that was, um, yeah, that tells you something about collaboration and the English stage <laughs> and the rivalries and so on. But, um, also yeah, on a like it. Thanks for the tip, I'll look that up. Also on a lighter note, um, I read all of Shakespeare in high school and college, but wow. they didn't really get it until I watched the Reduced Shakespeare Company. Has oh, anybody yeah. ever seen that? Yes. They really do like what 10 or 12 of Shakespeare's plays in an hour, in 90 minutes it's yeah, hilarious it's really funny. and the other yeah. thing is, you know Mina you mentioned why do people still fall for forgeries and I was uh saying that people don't really understand Shakespeare but the other side of it is everybody now knows Shakespeare they learn it in school kids are forced to <laughs> memorize it uh, my kids teachers told them okay take Julius Caesar and boil it down so you can do it in 40 minutes so you're editing Shakespeare, which some people would say, you can't do that, he's uh, matchless. But um, when you have everybody understanding what Shakespeare sounds like, the general sound, you know, forsooth and beseech, it makes it easier, first of all, to be a forger because you're using all this language that's second nature to school children. Mm -hmm. And also with actors, you have people like Robin Williams, when he was a young stand-up comedian, used to improvise Shakespeare. He would say, give me a time, a place, and a, a thing, and a Three Mile Island, Twelfth Night, and something else. And he would get up there and just rapidly seem to be performing Shakespeare, um, but working in Three Mile Island and other, you know, Watergate or something. <laughs> and if um, you internalize it, you can just um, parrot it back. And then it's hard for neutral people to say, is that really him or isn't it? It kind of sounds like Shakespeare. And that mm -hmm. helps the forgers because they'll say, well, it sounded like Shakespeare. In fact, it mm -hmm. sounded a lot like Henry V meets Macbeth, which it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So any other last questions? No? All right, well, Doug, thank you so much. This has been incredibly enlightening. Okay. Um, I do have to say that reading the plays and then seeing the plays for me has always been the thing that helps me understand them better. Yeah, I wish it wasn't so expensive. But uh, yeah. yeah, you can do workshops and even good school productions. I still remember when my kids were in middle school, they put on Lady Macbeth and they had a seventh grader do Lady, Mac Lady Macbeth. And boy, she was so intense. <laughs> it was great. I've seen bad productions too, but it's worth trying. Yeah, but sometimes putting the words in a, you know, in somebody's voice, it's just it just helps. Um, we're getting some thank yous. I see a couple of people have unmuted themselves. I don't know if there was any additional comments or questions. I just wanted to say thank you. It was excellent. Okay. Thanks for thanks for being here. <laughs>
<laughs> awesome. awesome. So thank you, Doug. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, I know we have some great um, Shakespeare fans in, in um, town. We did a Shakespeare reading last summer and it was phenomenal. You know, we just shared different roles and, um, and we, it was fun and we learned a lot. Yeah. So I forgot to mention this April is the anniversary of Shakespeare's birth and his death. So. Ah, so it was a good time for us to have Doug with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a wonderful night, everybody. I will send out a recap with um, the video recording. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Doug, thank again you. for. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank Reggie. You yeah. Thank you.